Hi, everyone. Uh, we are going to give it just a minute or so for everyone to populate the Zoom webinar room. But thank you all for joining us today. And while we get started, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen super fast. OK. So you are here today for another CSC Care webinar. My name is Robin Bauer Kilgo, and I'm coming to you just outside of Washington, DC in Silver Spring, Maryland. Um, a couple of quick Zoom tips for everyone, which I think we are all very aware of how Zoom works, but it's always good to remind you that um, we are recording today's session. So um, if you have to bow out early or you maybe know someone who might be interested in it, feel free. And we'll probably have this recording posted on our website probably early next week. Um, I've also enabled closed captioning for this webinar. So if you're interested in that service, feel free to hit that CC button down at the bottom and that system will pop back on. So you are here today for Old Wives Tales and Urban Legends C2C Care webinar as part of the annual Ask a Conservator Day. Hope you enjoyed today's program. Again, my name is Robin Bauer Kilgo and I am the C2C Care Coordinator. If you're new to us, I always like to point out our home on the web, uh, connecting to collections.org. On that website, you will find all sorts of future information on programming. Um, you will get links to our archive of webinars and courses. You will also find a link to our moderated community where you can ask questions for amongst a group of fabulous monitors and experts who will answer you that, answer them on questions on direct collections care and also a source of curated resources. So I encourage you to go to that website if you are interested. Uh, we have two places online or on social media that you can follow our program. They are on Facebook and on Twitter. So I encourage you to go to those if you're interested in future programming or just what's happening within the collections community in general. And as I said, we're using Zoom webinar today. So you have two ways to communicate to us. You can communicate in the chat to say hello, or you can do uh, questions in the Q&A box. So this format today is going to be a little different where um, we are going to be, you're gonna have a chance. We've already had some questions submitted to our panelists who are joining us today, but you will also have a chance to ask some questions. Um, I also wanted to kind of set the base for today's program where um, we are not here to make fun of or do anything in that line for these ideas that came up during uh, when we did the general call out for if you'd heard anything unusual amongst your experience in the collections world when it came to cleaning or collections care. Um, our goal today is really to make you make you kind of I guess come to the realization that I think is important to everyone that we all hear these kind of stories. Um, you're not alone. Everyone has heard some sort of interesting story coming off the street, possibly from a potential donor that maybe you would like to say, I'm not sure about that but you're not quite sure of if there's factual basis to it. So we're hoping today's program will actually give you some tips and tricks on how to kind of handle these kind of questions that come off the street when it comes to collections care. So just heads up on that. Um, we have three panelists joining us today. We have Heather Galloway, conservator of painted surfaces, Courtney Murray, who's the objects conservator at the Midwest Art Conservation Center, and Sarah Norris, who's the Assistant Professor in Practice in Library and Archives Conservation and Preservation at the University of Texas School of Information. So today's program is going to be us looking at some of these questions that have been submitted, talking about them, seeing if there's some truth, seeing if there's some fallacy, and then we're going to maybe have some fun along the way, all part of Ask a Conservator Day, an annual thing that happens every November 4th. So I'm going to go ahead and hop to our first question that was submitted. Um, and we're going to kind of open this up for a general conversation. But the first question that was submitted on our anonymous form was saliva can be a good spot cleaner on solid surfaces as it contains enzymes that help remove dirt. So I'm going to open the floor to everyone and see if they have any thoughts on that. The question of using saliva on surfaces. Heather, do you have any thoughts on that concept? Yes, I do. Yeah. Um... I'm not muted, correct? Yes. Nope, you're good. Um, uh, it is actually true. Yes, it is true. Saliva, which is 98% water, uh, does have a number of things that can aid in cleaning, electrolytes, um, antibacterial compounds, and it has some enzymes, including amylase, which is an enzyme that conservators will sometimes independently try to uh, access to aid in cleaning. Um, 
Uh, it also has ions in it that can help um, in the exchange of uh, picking up dirt. So it is true that saliva can be used in cleaning. Uh, on a practical level, uh, it really gives you uh, a brand new definition of dry mouth. Uh, it's very difficult to clean something a lot with saliva. And if you get down onto the scientific level for uh, conservation scientists who are trying to aid us in um, working with cleaning solutions, they will tell you that you should rinse your saliva from the surface of something because you would be leaving uh, those non-water-based components behind, such as the enzymes. Uh, but it is often the one of the first go-tos that I have when I stick a swab in my mouth. Um, you can't get it very wet. So it means if I'm about to touch a surface that's gonna be water sensitive uh, with saliva, I tend not to bring much moisture. So it is true, we can use saliva. I use it mostly in testing and it's, it's not, from my point of view, it's not practical to clean uh, with saliva, but maybe some of the other participants have uh, some ideas. So Courtney, you you deal with objects, right? So yeah. what's been your experience with using saliva? Uh, I'd say the same as Heather. Um, yes, it's great for testing. Um, occasionally, I'll use it in a situation where I do want to control the amount of moisture that I'm bringing to the surface. Um, I will just note though that like your own saliva changes depending on what you just ate <laughs> or drank. So if you just drink a cup of coffee, then your saliva is much more acidic than, you know, than if you drink a glass of milk, for example, or something else. So um, I always try to be aware of that if I'm going to do a test with saliva, because um, as Heather was saying, it's difficult to repeat it. Um, you know, you can test and have one cleaning effect, but all of the variables of your own saliva change. So it's important to keep in mind. Um, and yes, not practical when you're talking about cleaning something that's like huge and massive. Unless you got a lot of interns. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would not encourage that. But yeah, it is interesting that there's a little bit of truth to it. You know what I mean? And yeah. I know working with conservators, they've often said, oh, no, saliva. <laughs> I've always been, I was like, OK, <laughs> when I first heard that. So it's kind of yeah. fun to know that there is some truth to that. So very cool. All right. So our next question, this is going to be heading over to the to probably Sarah with a library background. So we have two. One is which is lamination is an easy way to preserve documents and that book tape must be good to use on books. So Sarah, what kind of thoughts do you have on both those points? Well, so we'll start with the um, point about lamination. So um, lamination is just kind of the eternal siren song of paper preservation, right? It gives you this sense um, that you have really strengthened a document when you coat it in plastic and you see what was fragile before can now be waved around willy nilly and, you know, children can draw on it and I can get the crayon off and all that good stuff. Um, the, the challenge though with lamination is there are several. First of all, um, lamination is not a reversible treatment. And in conservation, we care about that a lot. We really want to be sure that whatever steps we take can be undone if we find a better solution in the future. I have an assistant today. Um, lamination is um, a process that melts plastic into paper fibers, and it's really quite difficult to undo that once it's been done. Um, so that's one problem to keep in mind. The other thing, though, is that the plastic um, is often shorter lived and less dimensionally stable than is the paper that you've coated in. So you kind of introduce more problems when you put bring plastic into the mix um, because the, the paper oftentimes would have lasted longer and remained more stable on its own. Um, I say all that, but also I'll just point out that um, there really is a tradition to this desire to laminate. Um, that ties back into all of these um, library and archives preservation traditions involving like silking, um, lining, this goal of putting a supportive surface on a document. Um, there can be good and supportive ways to do that, but lamination is not unfortunately one of them. So when people are asking about lamination, how to preserve documents, um, typically what I tell them is um, don't do that. But you can seek out a mylar sleeve, an archival plastic sleeve, 
And that's a great way to keep all the pieces together and it's much less invasive. Um, so that's one note on lamination. And um, the second was on book tape. So this is a question I've gotten a lot from libraries. Um, <clears throat> in circulating collections, especially libraries oftentimes really need to have a quick fix. And librarians will reach for a product called book tape to affix spines that have fallen off and boards that have fallen off, covers that have fallen off. Um, that product um, is not necessarily archival standard and it can be very proprietary. So you don't know what you're getting into with book tape. Likely you're getting a product that's built to last well for maybe five years or so. And if that's the lifespan of your book, then uh, that's all right. But most of us want our books to last for longer than that. So after that, we start to see the tape lifting, leaving sticky adhesive behind that attracts dirt. Um, the adhesive can start to move into the paper or the covering material, and then it's very difficult to get out, starts to cause staining and all kinds of problems. Um, so book tape, again, it seems like a, a nice, easy solution that's, it's a little too good to be true. Um, and if people are asking me about book tape, oftentimes I'll say kind of similarly to the lamination, um, try looking into book jackets, dust jackets, boxes, enclosures, things that can keep the pieces together more passively than applying tape directly to the object. Perfect. Thanks. Now, someone did ask in the chat, is this the Linaco book tape? I think there's a couple different producers of book tape out there, correct? Yes. Not just, yes. yeah, that's what I Yeah. Think. Lots of different brands, lots of different types, lots of different proprietary variations. And this is a big issue with tape is that the manufacturers don't have to tell you what's in that adhesive. Um, so you don't know when you don't know what you're putting on the surface that's going to move into the paper and stay there oftentimes for the remaining lifetime of the object. So um, avoid it if you can. Someone just uh, put in the chat, this is interesting, they said, or in the Q&A, they say they collect old books. The bindings are almost all cloth covered boards. Some bindings are yellow. Um, a few are emerald green. I can't decide what to do about these books. Can I safely read them? They're on bookshelves in my home. Is it okay to leave them there mixed with other books? Hmm. I would think so. Yeah. But what do you think? Um, most likely, yeah. Um, the If you can take care in reading and handling, um, they should be good to use and certainly okay to store with other materials nearby. Mm -hmm. um, the only storage concerns I would have might be, you know, if you had acetate based plastics or something like that, but that really moves us more into film and photograph. So um, without seeing the objects, um, I, it seems safe to store with other books and to use gently. Thank you. All right, so we're going to move on now uh, to, it seems like when we did the open call, one of my favorite things is a lot of the things that popped forward were for food-based, which I found mildly fascinating as, as I was going through the questions that were submitted. So we kind of gathered a bunch of them under the idea of just use of lemon as a general cleaning agent. It seemed like this kind of went across types and objects and anything else. So um, we're going to just generally talk how people seem to love using lemon for cleaning things and kind of what may, might be the ramifications for different types of objects. Um, I know one of the first ones we talked about was cleaning marble with lemon. And I think either Heather or Courtney might have some thoughts on cleaning marble with lemon. Yeah, I can start. Um, so marble is calcium carbonate chalk, same chemical formulation. Um, it's easily damaged by acids. Lemon is essentially citric acid, a strong, um, in the world of acids, it's actually not a strong acid, but it, it is acidic enough that it will eat into the surface of the marble. And so if you clean with marble, you are clean with lemon on marble. It is effective, but you're removing part of the surface. Um, and it's, you know, much stronger than you really need to be in terms of um, removing the grime on marble. And so, you know, practically conservators are often working with um, much in a much more controlled way with acidic or basic solutions. And we like to be closer to the neutral or slightly basic pH when we're cleaning marble because we don't want to be etching into the surface of the stone. Um, 
but yeah, that, that general citric acid principle applies across all different types of objects. Um, so lemon in general is a good cleaning and you'll see it in all kinds of household cleaning products for that reason. I don't know, Heather, do you have something to add to that? Um, you know, I don't know if, if I do really, uh, as a group, we had sort of talked about how so many of these cleaning solutions, when it's food based, I would think that one of the first things you should Google is how acidic or basic is that main component, because yeah. that is what's leading it to being used as a cleaning product, generally speaking, that people are trying to interrupt the the attachment of the dirt to the surface and when they're looking at something that is acidic they're usually uh, dealing with uh, mineral based uh, rust stains things like that the marble itself that's not something they think they're do you know necessarily doing but in attacking that dirt they are attacking the marble which is releasing alongside the dirt so there's usually some reason that somebody is going for something acidic it may be rust stains uh, it may be copper staining if you see things with, that are stained blue, like marble stained blue from a fountain. Um, that's, you know, the copper from the pipes being deposited in the marble, uh, and it shows up like a blue pigment. Um, so rust stains, again, the same thing. So acids mm -hmm. tend to work on that, where bases tend to work on um, oily, uh, fatty dirt layers and greases and things like that. So a lot of times, you know, I just sort of start with a simple... Google search as to what is, you know, lemon juice or what is vinegar? Is it acidic? Is it basic? And it starts to give you an idea. It's almost always one of those, well, a lot of times it's one of those two things to sort of build mm -hmm. a cleaning solution. Um, whereas dish soap is supposed to be neutral. So um, yeah, so I, those are my thoughts on it. There's logic. We've talked about that. There is a logic behind this. There is an actual action uh, at work here. It's whether uh, for historic cultural objects, it's controlled enough. Yeah. Well, I think also too, like we even read about lemon. Lemon seems to be very pervasive. Like that's even used in books, right, Sarah? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> we saw some instances where um, people had used lemon to reverse highlighter, to, to clean highlighter marks off their books. For example, like, you know, so you've got your college textbooks and you want to sell them back or something and you want to take all that highlighter out. We saw some tips online saying, oh, use some lemon juice to take that highlighter right off. Well, once again, it all comes down to pH. So um, highlighters, are oftentimes made with pyranine, um, which is um, a component that's pH sensitive. Um, we know that uh, lemon juice is very acidic. And so if you hit that highlighter, that pyranine with something acidic, you will change the color. Um, a lot of dyes function that way. Um, a lot of dyes are very pH sensitive. And so we're very aware of what's going on with pH and conservation treatments to be careful that the dyes are gonna behave the way that we, we intend. Um, but in this case, the answer is yes, but no. Um, yes, you, you can, strictly speaking, um, use lemon juice to clean off highlighter marks, but it isn't good for the paper underneath. Um, because it's so acidic, um, it will encourage that paper over time to turn brown and become brittle and really just to age faster than it needs to. Um, so what what you've done in sort of seemingly a positive way for the, the cleaning, for removing the highlighter, really has a negative long lasting impact for the paper underneath. And so it's kind of just a question of keeping the big picture in mind. Yeah, it seems like lemon, it, it seems like, and you guys correct me if I'm wrong, that some of these might seem like short term wins, mm -hmm. but in the long term, it's not good for the object right? When it comes to like using something like a lemon, like an, I guess it's basically an acidic, you know, and I mean type thing, it can end up hurting that. Is that true? Or is that too much of a... Yeah, I mean, statement? I think um, similar to what Sarah was saying with marble, um, uh, cleaning with an acidic solution, in addition to etching the surface, it sometimes can cause discoloration that doesn't become apparent until kind of later down the line. Um, and so, yeah, totally. It seems like a short-term win and turns out that eventually could be um, aesthetically not even acceptable anymore. Yeah. 
Yeah. And this is actually something that comes up to you. Occasionally people have asked me, oh, paper conservation, is that like in the National Treasure movies? Well, <laughs> not exactly, because what you see in the National Treasure movies actually falls right into what we're talking about right now. They use lemon juice um, to activate disappearing and reappearing inks. And it's mm -hmm. the same concept. They're playing with pH, but we would never take something so acidic as lemon juice and put it on valuable documents because of what it'll do to the paper over time. Right. That's like, it's so funny when movies introduce these concepts to the public, but then like, it's like my husband is a former military and he cracks me up for every time he sees a Navy person, like with their ribbons, I hear this whole story about how the ribbons are wrong. And then when we watch movies that like, like uh, night at the museum is always the basic example when they're like, here's all the storage underneath the Smithsonian. I'm, I'm always like, what is happening? Like whenever I see those. So it's, it's one of those ideals where again, there's some truth in there. But it's, it's, you know, once you get a little bit more knowledge in it, you realize that these things could hurt or they're just not telling the truth for whatever reason. So thanks, movie industry. Okay, let's, let's move on to our next one. One second. Okay. So our next one, we're going to move over to more the leather world. Again, we had kind of ones that I'm going to group together right now, just because they seem kind of alike, or we can have the same kind of basic conversation. Uh, protecting, people asked about protecting leather bindings by applying shoe polish, which is probably very readily available, or the idea of retanning leather using olive oil and animal brains. Now, again, we're trying to figure out if there's some truth to some of these, or if it's all just kind of you know, avoid it, Okay. So Courtney, let's start with you. What are your, what are your thoughts on some of these? Uh, well, let's talk about tanning first. Um, tanning, so oil tanning and brain tanning are two legitimate tanning techniques that are used. Um, they're traditional tanning processes that are used primarily by um, native or indigenous communities. Um, they involve dressing the skin with oil and or grains and then um through a process of washing and manipulation and repeated manipulation and wringing it out um and working it with metal and bone tools and then stretching it to dry that's how actually the leather is tanned in the first place um so that is totally legit the idea of retanning something down the line is not something that I'm particularly familiar with. So I'm curious if someone asked that question, if they have experience with that, I'd be really curious to hear. It's not something we would do on a historic artifact. Um, it's very, I would consider that to be very invasive. Uh, the level of manipulation that would be required, it would be well above and beyond um, what you what would be safe for most historic artifacts. And in, in addition, once a skin is tanned, the collagen starts to break down over time and, and it becomes weaker. And so that level of, you know, moisture introduction and manipulation would just, it would just not be safe for the artifact. Um, but I'm curious in an active use situation, as in, um, you know, a piece of regalia or something that's being actively used and worn over and over and something that can be replaced more easily if, if people are actually doing that. So if somebody is, definitely let me know. Um, and then in terms of oiling and dressing leather, everyone loves to oil and dress leather, saddle soap, et cetera. Generally not good for the leather long-term. And they have, it's nice. Okay. So these things seem really great because when you put them on the leather, they seem like they take a piece of something that's a little bit stiff and sort of give it some flexibility again. And that can be really nice in the short term, but in the long term, a lot of these are oil-based um, products. These proprietary dressings are oil-based products and the oils themselves, they often never fully dry. And so they can actually attract pests and dust to your surface. In addition, they start to oxidize over time. 
and that can cause the leather to become even more stiff than it was originally. And so you're in sort of this like never ending cycle of <laughs> stiffening, drying, not to mention darkening. Darkening is something that very much is real and happens when you apply um, oil to leather. So in general, um, no on dressing leather. We try to stay away from that as much as we possibly can. Um, leathers, I will say, can be sometimes, depending on the type of leather, be safely waxed. Um, and that is an alternative um, to oiling or dressing in a situation where you need to improve the saturation visually. Um, the wax can help be a protective buffer. Um, but of course, that's only for a specific type of leather. So like a vegetable tanned leather that has a shiny compacted surface um, is going to accept wax in a very different way than a brain tanned or smoke tanned hide will. Um, so very case by case conservators are very careful to not introduce um, oils and or, you know, moisture and saddle saddle soaps specifically also are very alkaline often very alkaline and leather itself is acidic. And so again, back to this concept of pH, you don't wanna be shocking the surface of the leather with something that's very alkaline. Leather doesn't like that until you're actually accelerating the deterioration by applying it. Heather, do you have anything to add? I know you had some thoughts about this as well. Yeah, no, I think Courtney's like, yeah, hit obviously she's, she's done it. I can't, I can't improve. <laughs> I will say that in another, uh, another C2C care course that we're doing right now, we talked a little bit about a, a thing that happens. I just like the name. I bring it up any chance I can of this thing called fatty acid spew, which is, uh -huh. um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Courtney, it's basically when almost like the, the fat gets pushed out of the leather, like it gets oversaturated yeah. and it kind of appears. I just like the name fatty acid spew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it looks white. It can be easily confused with mold um, because of the way that it looks on the surface. And there's this really great um, blog that was put out by the Alaska State Museum that's called um, What's the White Stuff? If anybody's mm -hmm. interested to read it type that into Google and it'll send you down a rabbit hole of reading about fatty acids view and mold and how the white crystalline material on leather can be a variety, all kinds of different things, including pesticides and, and other, and other fun gems. Yeah, exactly. We, so see, it, we see it a lot in leather bindings. Um, mm -hmm. it, there's, there's a long history to it, regrettably, <laughs> but we've actually just been looking in, in uh, one of my classes uh, this last week, we've been looking at pictures, trying to distinguish is this leather spew or is this mold to try and, you know, get ourselves trained. It, it can be pretty, pretty confusing out there in the real world. Yeah, well, and the person who was uh, telling us about it, Fran Ritchie, she works with uh, taxidermy type stuff with National Park Service. She was saying that they're trying to figure out kind of what, I mean, they know what causes it, but they were trying to figure out a little bit more about like if a certain type of temperature or, you know, that kind of environmental condition can kind of do something with it. And so far, they haven't really had much luck in tying the things together. So that's what that was kind of interesting, interesting. as well. You know, it also happens with chocolate. If anybody's ever seen old chocolate, it gets that white kind of film yep. on the surface, like same kind of chemical situation happening there. Totally interesting. Okay, so we'll, we'll get a fatty acid spew, which again, I could just talk about <laughs> all day because the name's just fun to say. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, this is, we're changing gears again now a little bit. Um, two things that again, dealt with food-based, because again, this was a theme <laughs> throughout all these questions. Um, one was cleaning metal with salt, ketchup, tomato paste, or toothpaste. And then uh, removing rust with Coke or molasses. So I think we're going to hear some of the same basic theories that we've heard previously, but I did want to hear some more. Uh, the ketchup thing actually came up in the Q&A as well, like about if people use ketchup to clean up on metals. I think it's a good one to hit regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I guess I'll dive, I'll dive in first. Um, a lot of times what people are trying to clean on metals is tarnish. Um, so if you're talking about silver, that's silver sulfide tarnish. Most frequently it's black. It looks um, dark on the surface. It can be disfiguring. It's actually bound to the surface of the metal. So it's caused by sulfur in the air. So you'll hear conservators talk a lot about how you store your silver um, because if you can basically eliminate 
the fact that the silver is exposed to the atmosphere, then you can actually keep it from tarnishing. So conservators really love to use things like Pacific silver cloth um, that to wrap objects in. We use acid-free tissue as a barrier often between the metal and the silver cloth itself. We talk about putting uh, metal in plastic containers like polypropylene, polyethylene containers um, or bags that can also help with this. But once the tarnish forms on silver, it's you know understandable that you would want to be able to take it off because silver is in most cases, I will say in most cases, not meant to look black. Um, and so lots of people reach for all kinds of different acidic solutions to try to take off, take off this silver sulfide tarnish. And I'll just quickly mention that with brass or a copper alloy, it's the same general principle, except for the, the corrosion is different. It's an, often an oxide corrosion that's just darkening um, the surface. So ketchup is acidic, tomato paste is acidic, um, lemon juice, like we talked about, is acidic. These are salsa. I've heard salsa before. Salsa is also acidic. Um, you'll hear the combination of like lemon juice plus salt. Or you'll hear, um, you know, all kinds of different. There's the always. There's also the um, aluminum foil plus baking soda method of cleaning, removing tarnish. So all of these are like these homegrown methods that have basis in in science. So um, to remove tarnish, conservators often reach for um, mechanical removal methods first. So we like to remove. Um, corrosion in the most controlled, gentle way that we possibly can. And for us, that usually means making a slurry of calcium carbonate um, and working very gently. And we like that because we know exactly what's in it and we can control the pressure and the amount of cleaning that we're, that we're doing on the surface. Um, something like a lemon juice plus salt or a ketchup or a tomato or a salsa, those are they have some cleaning principles and they're most similar to um, proprietary dips that you can buy on the market because they're really, you're really taking an acid to the surface to remove, you're taking a strong acid to the surface to remove that layer of, of corrosion. Um, I'll mention that both with polishing, which um, we like, to do and, and dips, which we like a little bit less, um, you're taking off a layer of the silver itself because it's, it's actually bound to the surface. And so every time you polish, you're taking off a little bit of silver. And that actually can be an issue because a lot of objects, a lot of objects that are silver are actually plated. Um, so they have a base metal underneath. And I, I have a slide to show actually that illustrates this pretty well. I will share my screen quickly. Okay, so on this slide, you can see that here are five examples of metals that at first glance look to be silver, but they're actually all a little bit different. So you can see that the, um, in the top left, the sterling silver, looks a lot like on the top right, the coated gilt silver. So there are traces of coating, there are traces of gilding there. On the left, the sterling silver looks like it could have traces of gilding or, or traces of coating, but in this case, neither of those are present, present and you're just seeing the tarnish pattern. Um, and then I'm also including pictures of pewter and nielo. Nielo is, uh, intentional darkening of a recessed design area and you want to be I mean very very careful because that's easy to remove and it's totally irreversible once you do um, and then you know gilt silver itself often the gilding is compromised or lost because things have been polished in the past. And so it's really important before you ever start to think about polishing or removing tarnish to really understand what your metal is because there are lots of different variations that look super similar. Um, let's see, what else can I add to that? Uh, polishing cloths are generally fairly gentle options for you know most people to use and i'll see the baking soda the baking soda aluminum combo that's actually like an electrical 
electrochemical, um, hmm. electrolytic method of cleaning. That's a redox reaction. So that's entirely a different set of reactions, but it requires that you immerse the object fully in the solution. And for a lot of historic objects, that's just not appropriate. Um, anything that has weird hollow areas where moisture could get trapped, like a handle or a, you know, a hollow area of the design, um, you, would, you definitely wouldn't want to do full immersion there. And it's also very difficult to control. You have, you know, it's happening before your eyes, which seems like magic, but you also can't reverse it easily. So these things are, they're um, conservators. We always like to take a very cautious approach. So we're often going to start with the, you know, the most gentle method and progress upward as we need to. Right. Heather, did you have any thoughts about the the use of Coke? <laughs> like, I find that I know I've watched videos of people putting pennies in Coke, which my kids love. But I'm I'm, I'm pretty sure we're talking about the same sort of reactions and yeah. the same sort of things will apply to what Courtney's talking about. A lot of um, a, a a lot of the distinction between what you might do in the home and and what a conservator might do in a studio or lab space is is all about control, stopping the uh, the reaction and clearing it too. You know the other thing that we worry about a lot, even with conservation, as we're creating our own cleaning solutions, um, there's a huge emphasis on. Uh, what doesn't evaporate from the surface, what gets left behind, and how do you make sure uh, you're taking that away? How do you judge the effectiveness of your cleaning? I was, you know, if you're cleaning uh, with Coca-Cola on a penny, can you actually see what you're doing if the cleaning solution is colored Coke colored brown? Um, you have no way of judging the effectiveness of your cleaning until it's too late. You know, I was thinking of the Niello. It's like my mother's ring here. It's got pickling. I know, Courtney, is that really the same thing as Niello in terms of the pickling solution they put on? You know, if you drop this. Yeah, yeah I, go ahead. You drop this into a bath and start a reaction. It It's indiscriminate. And my mother's ring would come up with without this shading that happens in the recesses, purposeful shading. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, it's in, I mean, it's like you said, too, like a lot of these things that you all have said at different times is you either you won't be able to stop the reaction or it's not reversible. Right. So you have to be very careful about kind of what what you're experimenting or I don't want to say experimenting what you're doing to the object for sure. I mean, the, the, for me, when I'm working with young conservators and teaching them how to clean an object, the difference between what we might do is, is you're always a set of eyes and you're, you're, you're using your discernment. What is the effect of what I'm doing? You don't want to lose control of it by just letting us a, a, a reaction just start to run away. Um, you know, how do you rinse from the solution? But the surgeon goes into an operating room with a scalpel. They go in to cut something out of you carefully, but that scalpel can hurt you. We are using tools and equipments and, and we're using pH in a way to have an effect. Um, all of these things can also have a harm if they're not controlled properly. Yeah, exactly. All right, so let's change, let's switch back over to the world of books, which is always fun to go find out about. Let's see if I can share my screen again. So the next one that came up, which was uh, one that popped up, was using kitty litter to deodorize books. Sarah, do you have any thoughts on that? Of, is kitty litter good? Is kitty litter bad? Will it hurt the books? I like this one because finally I get to say yes. <laughs> yes, you really can do this um, in a controlled fashion. Clearly, you're using clean kitty litter. Um, so the application for this is maybe you've got books that have been through a fire or were stored um, around a lot of cigarette smoke, something like that, where it's not um, a, a mechanical problem um, posed to the volume so much as it is that the thing just smells bad and it's kind of driving you crazy. Uh, kitty litter can work. And the way you use this is to enclose the book in a chamber with kitty litter in the bottom of it um, and just let it sit for a period of days. It works because kitty litter, or at least a lot of kitty litters have in them zeolites. Um, and zeolites are a, a type of, of molecule that has lots and lots and lots of pores in it. 
that can grab onto impurities in the air. And in this case, we're using them to grab onto scents that are unpleasant to us and hold it. Now it's, it's not, um, they don't break it down, but they do grab those components and hold them and lock them up. Um, kitty litter is not the only way to get zeolites. We talk about them in a lot of applications and conservation. Um, you, uh, they, zeolites happen um, organically, like through activated carbon or synthetically, like people can make them. Um, you'll find them in little sachets for um, absorbing um, acetic acid off-gassing um, in collections. You'll find them embedded in a product called microchamber paper that we can use to interleave um, between acidic papers to help absorb acidic off-gassing over time. So um, zeolites are kind of a broad category of, of um of object of material that have a lot of different applications. Um, but as far as home applications, um, kitty litter is one of the best places you can find zeolites. And so um, that's why kitty litter really can work to deodorize your books if you need to do that. Yeah, someone said in the Q&A, which works better, kitty litter or activated charcoal? So I'm also wondering what's cheaper. <laughs> Kitty litter yeah, I mean, charcoal. right. You'd have to to price it out yourself. I think. I mean, there's some upper scale kitty litters that I think actually have a little bit of activated charcoal in them. Um, baking soda can work the same way. So if you just enclose the volume in a chamber with baking soda and a little reservoir down in the bottom, so that it's not sprinkled on your volume and something that you have to clean off later, but it's just kept separate and enclosed together in a small area, it, it can do a lot of the same work for you. Yeah, perfect, thank you. I have a question actually. Oh, Does sure. it matter what type of kitty litter? Like a clay-based or, you know, cause there are so many different types of kitty litters. Yeah, there are. So um, look for the ones that market themselves as containing zeolites mm -hmm. because they're also really effective at soaking up odor as you know, kitty waste. So um, that's a, a marketing point for those products to say that they're extra odor absorbent. And if they're telling you up, up front that they've got zeolites in them, then you know that's probably effective for your purposes too. Just don't put it directly on the volume. <laughs> Nothing else you've confused the cats. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> let me flip over to this. So our next one, again, going after speaking about kitty litter, let's go back to talking about food stuff. Um, so this one came in where it said cleaning of wood furniture with a mix of water, baby oil, and vinegar. And this person said this, which did make me laugh. A furniture salad dressing is how they said it, if that would be at all working. And then the other cleaning one that came up that we can talk about a little bit well as well is cleaning quilts with snow. So does anyone have any thought on the furniture salad dressing aspect of cleaning for wood furniture? Um, yeah, yes. Uh, a same, almost the exact same explanation as the leather dressing uh, really um, can seem like a good option at the time, can resaturate a surface, but also can really damage a varnish, can really um, eat into the surface of of something. Um, if you're talking about putting something acidic on the surface of furniture, you really need to understand what those historic finishes are. Um, and there are so many different types of historic finishes, and there are so many that have been added to or changed over time that you're dealing with multiple different layers of solubility all at the same time. And so, um, yeah, these dressings often have, they're often a little bit acidic. They often have oil in them that again, doesn't fully dry, um, can cross-link, can darken the, the appearance over time and can also um, attract grime, dust and impact the original finish. So uh, generally, again, with furniture, same as leather, conservators will stay away from, from it dressing furniture. Excellent. That mouthwash with the mold, yes. right? Yeah, so I was thinking of that and, um, you know, a lot of furniture does have varnishes that are um, related to picture varnishes as well. And alcohols, there's often um, an alcohol in a mouthwash. It's probably diluted to the sort of strength that might not hurt the furnish. 
uh, finish, but alcohols are very effective on, on, on removing uh, coatings that would fall under that category. So that would have to be uh, something you'd have to think about. You'd also have to think about uh, what's being left behind. What's been put into the mouthwash to make it taste great to you, the mint or whatever the, you know, uh, flavors that are that are not going to be rinsed off. And generally speaking, uh, alcohols for anything that is uh, varnished, it, for us, it's one of our primary solvents, ethanol, isopropanol, things like that, that we might use in order to remove a varnish. So you could do some serious damage, I think, with mouthwash <laughs> to your brain. <laughs> Noted. <laughs> it would smell good, I'm but it would have, smell good. <laughs> yeah, it would smell good. And again, it might have some effect because it may not dissolve your varnish, much like the marble being cleaned a little bit with the lemon. But what you're not seeing on a, on a, on a different level, microscopic level, is that you're etching that surface. And, and if you're... Right going after your furniture with something that's bringing an alcohol to the surface, you're not as benign, even though you can drink it as you think you are, because those things can have an effect on a natural resin coating. Interesting. Did you guys, did you happen to mention the, my recording stop for uh, just a brief minute, but did we talk about the quilts cleaning with snow at all? Is there any proof no, in that? No, but or? I do, I can, I, I, I pull the textile conservator. <laughs> quilts, no rugs yes really so there you go um her explanation was that she has done snow cleaning on a rug before snow um works sort of like dry eraser crumbs would work on the surface of a quilt or of a rug sorry not a quilt of a rug because it can kind of work its way down into the fibrous pile structure that's there and loosen, uh, kind of shock and loosen grime. So yes, she has done it before in a very controlled way, of course. Um, quilts, no, you don't have the same kind of fiber structure. And so you don't really have a reason to, to use that in that way. And in fact, there's a pretty high risk of damage to the quilt because a lot of quilts have, have finishes, different types of finishes on them that would be negatively impacted by the snow. I don't want to go any further down that line because I'm not a textile conservator, but that's the short answer that she gave me. Totally fine. That's fascinating. Thanks for sharing yeah. that. See, again, sometimes there's, there's truths, maybe slightly, it got yeah. translated, but hey, that's fascinating. <laughs> that, that's one of those instances. It's like the scalpel in the surgeon's hand. That's <laughs> where it, you're really, you're doing some sort of water-based cleaning and aqueous cleaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you start to, as a conservator, you start to guess why would that work? Well, because then the water's in a different form. So it may be not saturating the structure and be able to filter down through there. Uh, you could argue that a lot of things will ask you to use rainwater. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm assuming, well, if they're asking for rainwater, they're hoping you're not going through our old pipes that is leaching metals and bringing metal ions into the water that you're bringing that could deposit out on the strike. There's all sorts of ways where you start to try to get into the head of the person who suggested it, uh, where I think, you know, there's it's really fascinating to watch the way that uh, people are manipulating things without even really necessarily knowing uh, things that we're trying to be more explicit about. Mm -hmm. How do I gel water? How do I control water from penetrating? How do I keep water only at this interface? And you yeah. might be doing that with snow and not thinking in the same way that I am, but mm -hmm. coming up with the same, a similar way of handling things. So yeah. interesting, yeah. wow. We need more snow in Cleveland now. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving away from snow, you guys already got a hint of it. So <laughs> the gentleness of snow to lighter fluid, um, <laughs> using lighter fluid, or hairspray to remove adhesive from cloth and leather book covers. Sarah, I think you might have some information on that, yes? <laughs> well, yeah, so um, the, it's so interesting once again to see the, the grains of truth here. Um, so when, when conservators deal with old adhesives, many times we're dealing with situations in which yeah. the adhesives have become stiff or brittle, have been causing staining. Um, and so we'd like to get them out. Um, doing that often requires reaching for solvents and doing some solvent testing to see what solvents have the right parameters 
um, to reverse that old adhesive or that old staining that we're working with. My hunch here, and I don't know for sure, but my hunch is that if someone is reaching for lighter fluid or hairspray to address these things, what they're trying to reach for is maybe benzene or some kind of alcohol um, to um, achieve some solvent work at home um, and to use a variety of different solvents to see if they can soften and remove an old adhesive. Um, and they might be able to, depending on what that adhesive is and what its life has been and how it's been stored, they might have some success with that. But um, Heather, I love this uh, metaphor of the scalpel. This is a, a powerful tool, right? So um, if you're able to do solvent testing in a controlled setting with some knowledge of solubility parameter, parameters, um, you can identify a solvent that does the most good and the least harm. Um, if you just start throwing stuff at leather and textiles, um, it's much higher odds that you're going to inadvertently cause some harm. Even if you reverse the adhesive, you can cause further staining and further damage over time to the materials that that adhesive is sitting on. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I see, I think, some of the rationale here but it's a risky move and I, I wouldn't advise it. Perfect, thank you. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip one question. We'll see if we can get to it at the end because we do have some stuff in the Q&A, but um, I wanna hit this next one because one of our panelists tried it out and I wanted to talk about it. So cleaning yeah. porcelain, you said you did it. So now we have to talk I about did. it, cleaning. <laughs> so, so the idea of cleaning porcelain with mayonnaise, again, food-based, yeah. <laughs> like what, all the condiments are being covered, I think, in this talk today. Um, but is there any truth in this? So what do you have to say to that, Courtney? I was curious. I was curious. So mayonnaise is an emulsion. And mayonnaise is vinegar and oil and egg, right? So those are, you know, the egg is the emulsifier that allows the vinegar and the oil to mix and be held together. And in conservation, we really do like to use emulsions when we're cleaning um, because it allows us to bring a little bit of water to a water sensitive surface or a little bit of an oil or a, a nonpolar solvent to uh, the opposite, right? Um, so we do manipulate emulsions a lot. And so I thought, hey, this kind of seems interesting. I'm wondering if this would work. Um, so I have a porcelain sink at home and I tried the mayonnaise. I also went down a YouTube rabbit hole of watching people try the mayonnaise. The mayonnaise didn't work for me. I'll say that. It, I left it sit on the surface for about an hour because I forgot about it while I was doing other things. <laughs> and then I came back and and rinsed it and there was no change, but I would really love to hear if somebody had success with mayonnaise. Would I do it on historic object? Absolutely not. It's the no. same principles we've been talking about. It's acidic. You can't control it in the same way that you can control these other systems. You also can't see what you're doing because it's white, opaque. Um, and so would I do it on a historic object? No. Am I curious about it to know if somebody's had success? Yeah, totally. <laughs> Thanks, Courtney. I just had to call out that you tried it. I thought that was really <laughs> funny. I and well, and actually, I think that's a good point. Is you know, I keep thinking, um, it's you can't really do this on on historic objects. Although I guess the radiocarbon testing does kind of do this. But if you can try it out <laughs> on a small piece or something like it, one of these things, I'd say try it out, but not on the actual object, right? But like if 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 there is something that you can be like, I don't know, let's just try it and see what happens. You got an old book and you're like, let's see what happens when we throw lemon on it. You know what I mean? Like it, again, personal collection, you don't mind something happening to it. It's the 53rd copy of little women. It's nothing, you know what I mean? That you need to worry about. Give it a shot, see what happens. I mean, I know I do a lot of um, disaster and emergency salvage stuff on the side. And a lot of the hands-on stuff is throw a book in a kiddie pool, see what happens, right? And then having hands on of, okay, this is how you might bring it back to real life. So it's, I think it's useful sometimes to do these little experiments mm -hmm. and see what happens. Um, one question I wanted to hit from the Q&A that just popped up because this comes up a lot is if the material is listed as archival or museum grade, is it fine for, and they say conservation collection care? 
What are your guys' thoughts on that? Because I've been told something very distinctive on that, what you need to look for when it comes to that. Does anyone have any thoughts? I do. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts, Sarah? <laughs> that word archival is about as well regulated as the word organic. Um, it has a lot of implications, but in marketing, it doesn't have a formal definition. So um, it depends a lot on whether your vendor and your manufacturer is reputable and, and comes sort of from this world as to whether what they mean by archival is really what you want them to mean by archival. Um, in terms of um, books and paper, um, we would look for storage materials that are acid free, that are lignin free, and maybe that are buffered. Um, most times buffered materials are a good choice with a couple of exceptions. So that's a more precise way to define what we probably hope that archival means, but do have a little caution around that vocabulary because um, the, the vendors can play a little fast and loose with it sometimes. Yeah, the key words that you said that I've been told to look for is acid free, not archival. Look for something that says acid free, and then you're a little bit more because they hope someone in the chat also said PVC free. <laughs> so that's another thing to look for. But yeah, that, that archival word or museum quality is thrown around a lot and you have to really dig down. It is like reading a label on a piece of food. You know what I mean? Like where you're sitting there going, wait, what does that actually mean? Well, another we have, oh, go ahead. See, oh, one other good thing to see if you're dealing with photographs is if materials are marketed as being pat tested or photographic activity test tested, that's a good thing. That's legitimate. And that really does mean archival quality. Mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. All right, so I'm gonna hit the last question that I have in my list which is use of bread. <laughs> Seems like this was said a lot for various things. So it's use of bread, specifically white bread as a cleaning agent. And Heather, I think you had some insight into that, didn't you? Yeah, um, uh, it is used. Uh, it's been used in sort of two ways. Um, and if, if, you, if you are Googling, I think sort of on the on the broad internet, you'll see that people will use uh, suggest bread. They'll cut off the slightly stale bread. They'll cut off the crust, and they're essentially using bread as some sort of type of uh, eraser to absorb some of the dirt into the surface and rolling the sort of crumbs around. Um, obviously, just like the other things we've talked about. Uh, clearance, removing those crumbs from the surface is an issue and one that you have to have thought about before you start doing it. Uh, the content of moisture in your bread is super important. Uh, the drier your bread, and I have seen suggestions as slightly stale, uh, realize that you're then introducing an abrasive. If you have hard bread crumbs, you are abrasive cleaning. So, uh, so I think you, it, I, I'm not sure why I would go to bread. I, I will say there's a, there is a fairly long tradition in wall paintings of cleaning with bread. Um, and a lot of those breads are specifically made for cleaning. And um, I was talking to a Scandinavian friend uh, who was trained in a wall paintings program in Denmark. And uh, they were trained to make a bread dough, but it is not firmly cooked, it's, it's, it's stickier. And they're definitely using this more like what we would consider like a kneaded eraser. And they might be putting in, I'm trying to remember what it was, um, some sort of copper-based product to sort of uh, kill bacteria. Uh, they were putting in uh, sodium carbonate, I think, which is um, soda wash. Uh, so there, they were putting in something there to sort of make it basic. And then the description is, and you can find this again online too, and even on conservation uh, discussion groups of people sharing this recipe. Um, it's not cooked in the same way that you're going to uh, buy a loaf of bread from the supermarket. Um, and um, white bread, I think is mostly used also, again, once again, you can judge the effect of your cleaning. You're not gonna be able to tell that on pumpernickel or rye or whole wheat uh, because the dirt that you're probably trying to remove is gonna mimic that. Um, you know, the question always is, would you do it? And I don't know that I would use um, uh, stale bread. 
I just don't see the reason to do that. I feel like the abrasive qualities and things like that. If I was up on some mural on a wall painting and somebody introduced me to the to the the dough, the bread dough, which is gummier, and I thought it really worked, I might explore it, but I'd always be worried about leaving food on the surface. And food on the surface okay. is a source of insects. And I don't really need that either. You know, fly specks on a painted surface are more damaging um, than other things. So I would probably turn to some other form of uh, dry cleaning, you know, makeup sponges, soot sponges, something that, and even those things you have to, they're used and they can be used really effectively. And I use them all the time, but then I also have to be uh, removing anything that crumbles off of that, you know, with, you know, light vacuum, not against the surface and a brush, you know, it's always in the, it's, yes, in the controlled environment, yes, but be careful about what you're leaving behind. But bread actually, absolutely historically has been used as a cleaning agent for surfaces that are considered sensitive to water. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So again, there's, I think, you know, we've hit our hour mark. So I, I think that some of the take homes for this are, some of this stuff does have factual bases with modern technology, probably don't use it, <laughs> use some other items. Um, I, I do really appreciate all of your guys' thoughts and time that you took into these questions. I mean, they were just fun to read, to be honest, just to hear kind of what people have heard. Some of, and again, some of them were like, yep, I've heard that before. And some of them kind of stumped us for a little bit and got the, us to do some exploring, which I think was a lot of fun. So um, huge thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Sarah, for taking the time today to talk to us, all part of Ask a Conservator Day. Um, I'm going to go ahead and close out today's program. I did Someone, someone said in the chat that the idea of salsa did make them cringe. I would agree <laughs> just because like salsa is a little, yeah, a little cringy, but um, still this was quite fun. So thank you again. We will be working on our programming for 2023 at the CDC care in the next couple months. So keep an eye on our website. We also had a couple people asking just general kind of how do we uh, work? How do we store or care for photos? How do we do kind of general questions in the chat? We have done a lot of webinars with this program with C2C Care. I would encourage you to go to our website, connectingtocollections.org, and poke around those archives, and there might be a webinar on the question you're asking. So uh, do go there as well. So again, thanks you to all three of you. Thank you to IMLS for supporting our program, and I hope everyone has a great holiday, and we will see you all in the new year. So thanks again, and talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks.